After almost two decades of a close strategic partnership, China and Africa are bringing cooperation to a new level. But China has expanded its influence on the continent at a rate that raises eyebrows in Europe and the United States of America. As Chinese State Council and Foreign Minister Wang Yi pays an official visit to Ethiopia, Burkina Faso, Cambia and Senegal in the new year, what tops his agenda there? How do those countries view partnership with China and how does the rest of the international society look at closer ties between China and Africa? To discuss these issues and more, I'm very happy to be joined in the Beijing studio by He Wenping from the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences and Walter Ray Gu, Managing Director of uh, Kamal Group. That's our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Yang Rei. <music> Wenping, what do you think of the agenda of uh, State Councilor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi's current visit? Uh, first of all, this is a kind of uh, routine uh, Chinese foreign minister will do in the, you know, at the beginning of the year. This, uh, uh, this, kind of, uh, this kind of routine has been there for, I think, uh, more than 20 years. So this is shows, of course, uh, very what obvious. What kind of a routine visit? I mean, uh, without exceptions, at the beginning of a new year, the foreign minister would always uh, choose Africa as the first overseas trip. Is that what you mean? Oh, yes, exactly. Because this is to show China has paid a great attention uh, to develop the relation with Africa. So Africa always the first uh, travel destination, uh, desti a destination for a Chinese foreign minister. So I think uh, if my memory is correct, I think it started from 1990. So all the way. So every year, no exception for that. So this uh, year, I think uh, uh, like Foreign Minister Wang Yi chose those four countries. So it's very uh, meaningful, like uh, Ethiopia now has been widely regarded as uh, China in Africa. So they have been developed the industrialization in a very rapid way together with China's engagement there. A lot of Chinese investment has been investing in Ethiopia's industrial uh, uh, you know, uh, capacity building. So the second one, like uh, Burkina Faso, Gambia, they are all the newly uh, countries, you know, resume the diplomatic ties with China. So uh, I think uh, this is a very uh, right time to visit those two countries uh, to uh, cement uh, this uh, China and uh, those two countries' relations. And also like uh, uh, Senegal is going to be host the next China-Africa Cooperation Forum. Uh, in, I think it's in the 12, uh, maybe, you know, uh, 12, uh, this is 12, 19, and then plus three years, uh, 2022. So they will host uh, another uh, FOCAC meeting. Also, it's very important, uh, Western African countries, they're speak, uh, French speaking, used to be, you know, there's uh, less China's in engagement in those French speaking uh, African countries. There are more in the like uh, East Coast countries, African countries are less there. So I think uh, this kind of visit, plus like uh, President Xi Jinping himself also visited Senegal uh, in 2018, yeah, just the past, that is uh, July. So this is another, I think, uh, further uh, strengthen our bilateral ties. You seem to have answered all of my questions about oh, really? the current trip <laughs> by Foreign Minister Wang Yi. But uh, obviously, the agenda of our State Councillor and Foreign Minister, Mr. Wang Yi's agenda, has been carefully crafted to live up to the expectations of our brothers and sisters in Africa. But Walter, what do you make of uh, the implications of this agenda, despite all the convincing and insightful analysis by Madame He Wenping? Yeah, I think like uh, <coughs> Madam He just explained, you know, this is part of China's tradition of visiting the continent and the four countries were carefully chosen. So I think when you look at China-Africa relationship from a high level, I think that has already been established that it's good, you know, there's room to develop, but now what matters more is on the ground, what is happening on the ground. And, and you, of course, you know, the overhanging question now between China and Africa is the debt issue. So that was not covered as much, but it's definitely going to be one of the discussions that will come up during the trip. But is there a solution to the alleged debt issue that was uh, deliberately aroused by Western media to capture attention from those who are skeptical about China's uh, ambitions and the vision in this uh, promising continent? You know, I have been doing research about China-Africa for a long time. Sometimes it's very ironically to observe you know those issues, some people saying as the biggest, biggest concern, actually it's coming from media first. It's not coming from like... You uh, seem to be critical of the media, the role that I play. <laughs> no, 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 some media, some media. Some media. Of course, Chinese media. Which is motivated by job. politics. 
Yes, politics like this, that issue, like my colleagues just mentioned, is not started from Africa in, uh, themselves. It started from uh, Western countries, some media there. Uh, actually, I think uh, three years ago when I paid a visit to France, and I, w I had the t chances to talk about, you know, this Africa issue, China-Africa cooperation with uh, France, this uh, journalist and also some officials and some business person. Even as early as that time, they are saying, oh, very good, we appreciate China's engagement with Africa, you, you pay great attention there, you put a lot of investment, but be careful, those money, if caused the debt issue. So this is not good because uh, Paris, uh, you know, uh, club now has been doing this uh, debt relief uh, project there. But none of them coming from, this concern coming from Africa side. Recently, I have uh, also seen the Kenya President Kenyatta also answered this issue in a press conference. So in his words, like this kind of education, saying China is going to like take away a Mombasa, this port, because they cannot pay back the money uh, for building this Mombasa Ken uh, Lane Lobby Railway. So President Kenyatta said this is a totally groundless uh, allegation because uh, first of all, there's no such kind of item has been written uh, in that kind of uh, loan providing agreement. So this is not that kind of item. Secondly, uh, President Kenyatta said they even will pay ahead of those uh, yearly pay those debt to China. So there's no question about uh, short of payment. Mombasa Railway now has done a you know, very good business. I visited that railway twice. Yeah, when it's in it construction. is true somehow that the media always plays a nasty role in shaping negative perceptions about whatever uh, uh, they want to uh, alert attention to. Water, uh, President Xi Jinping promised uh, to uh, contribute up to 60 billion US dollars in aid, investment and financing to uh, Africa and much of this, uh, uh, most of the uh, beneficiaries of such a massive uh, investment project uh, will be in the sub-Sahara region. Uh, do you think China's approach is indeed an issue of a conspiracy? I think that question we need to step back and uh, analyze it because is there a big conspiracy coming from China towards Africa? Of course not. But that is not the issue that any legitimate observer is, is looking at. The people who are legitimately questioning the, the, the relationship, they have some legitimate issues to be raised. But the problem that is happening is that there is just too much noise that is going on between China and Africa. What do I mean by this? When I read Chinese media, I think, wow, China-Africa relations are the best thing that ever happened to the continent. Mm -hmm. When I read Western media, especially New York Times, Financial Times, I think, my God, China-Africa relationship is doomed. And like any other thing in this society, the truth is somewhere in between. The issue of Kenya's debt, for instance, you know, depending on what story somebody wants to tell, they will find the facts to back it up. So for instance, there have been people who have been claiming that Kenya's debt to China is 70%. So what does that mean? That is actually the bilateral debt. That is not the external debt for Kenya. The external debt of Kenya towards China is only 20%. So the people who want to portray China in a negative image will work with the higher number. The people who want to tell a better story will work with the lower number. But in reality, the truth is somewhere in between. The issues that are arising from this relationship and the issues need to be addressed. But the problem is right now it's very difficult to find middle ground because one side thinks everything is perfect and the other side thinks everything is negative. So there really needs to be a shift in how these uh, issues are engaged. What I've been doing on dialogue since almost 20 years ago is to try to present a complete picture by balancing view views uh, from Africa uh, against uh, somehow the very positive, very promising views from the Chinese experts in this case. Now, it seems uh, we have a lot more work to do uh, to minimize the negative impact of a prejudice and pride. Having said this, the Trump administration, Water, has unveiled a new Africa policy while accusing China and Russia of exploiting Africa with the predatory policies that stunt the growth of African nations allegedly and threatened their independence. Well, this is just a, a nasty depiction of China's uh, presence in Africa. Um, I went to South Africa to cover 
um, the uh, China African Summit. And I was impressed by China's enormous input into our campaign to help industrialize the impoverished sub Sahara region. Of course, we would export overcapacity. Of course, we would help, first of all, build infrastructure. So, what do you think of uh, you know, such efforts which may threaten to undermine the independence of African nations? I will say this, and I've said it many times before, and I'll keep saying it because I believe it's the truth. The best thing that China ever did in Africa was create competition. In 2000, mm -hmm. the economists said that Africa was the lost continent. China did not think so. That's when FOCAC was established. So over the years, China has you know, implemented infrastructure projects, investments, etc. But you know, China doesn't exist by themselves in the world. There was competition. The United States was getting ready to cut the budget of the foreign aid before this program was established. Now a 60 billion program supposed to counter China in Africa. From the African point of view, one, the fact that America has come back to the table, the fact that the road from Mombasa to Nairobi will be built by an American company, for us is good news. And this would have not happened without China because China being there has created competition. But to answer your question, do I think what John Bolton and his team have said, you know, our main purpose in Africa is to counter China, I don't see where any benefit can come through that. If your mission is not to work with the Africans to understand what the problem is, if your only mission is to counter China and Africa, then of course it's doomed to be failed. And, you know, in the 60s and 70s when America uh, was beginning its large foreign aid programs towards Africa, a lot of it, even the World Bank, was focused on infrastructure. But somewhere around the 80s, that changed. It changed more to soft aid. But now it seems we are back to the original stage, and this is mainly because of what China has been doing on the continent. So, you know, I don't want to speculate a lot. I think overall it's a good thing that the Americans are back. We just have to wait and see whether the program will work. In a typical market economy, competitions would definitely generate more benefits for consumers uh, as a result. So, despite the two major players, if not competitive, well, there are also uh, strategic competitors in Africa. We have Japan, the European Union. Uh, what do you think of the response from, uh, for example, Mr. Uh, Claude Juncker, uh, chairman of the European Union? And he, he also voiced somehow the uh, concerns on that tribe. What do you think of uh, the dilemma of the European Union in making a choice between the United States and China? since the Trump administration launched the trade war? Uh, well, uh, in terms of uh, cooperation with Africa, I think uh, our policy and our attitude has been always very clear. That is, welcome all the countries engage with Africa, because Africa now uh, developed, a com you know, comparative speaking, is still next behind. So they need help. Uh, even though they have a huge potential uh, to, to be uh, discovered. So this kind of cooperation, if leads to some kind of competition, I don't think it's a bad thing, like uh, we just discussed. Competition can bring more of uh, this kind of choice or alternative for Africans. So Africa now is uh, sitting in the driving seat, so more partners, you know, more beneficial for them, so, which is nice. So, but uh, if you bring some kind of a zero-sum game uh, in this kind of competition, uh, which is not good, which is not good for those players, also not good for Africans themselves, because they hardly find any room to, you know, to cooperate with all those players. Given the bitter memories of the Cold War, people could easily jump to the conclusion that the nasty competitions in Africa may well culminate with uh, proxy wars. And that, that was very bloody during the Cold War. You are watching dialogue with uh, Dr. He Wenping from the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences and Mr. Walter Regu, Managing Director of a Kamal Group. We'll be back in a short while. Stay with us, please. Welcome back. Well, how much does it take to have a big success on the industrialization in Africa? Well, this is a long process. Uh, I think, uh, for example, when we uh, review our China's past 40 years, we formed the opening up. So first, uh, we have to have a very, you know, this uh, rich human resources, very skillful, those uh, 
uh, workers, especially technicians, they can do those, all those construction work, not only PhD. So, and also second is infrastructure. So this infrastructure serves as a basis for this takeoff of industrialization. And the third one, I think, is the market itself. Now, comparing with China, uh, I think the African market is not big not united. What about the financing because vehicles, uh, the performance of the Chinese banks in Africa? Yeah, financial things is another thing I'm going to address because every, uh, even though you have uh, human resources, you have a market, you have uh, those uh, resources anyway, but if you don't have money, nothing you can, you can be, you know, push forward. So this is the another shortcoming uh, Africa has because this, uh, you know, uh, this uh, uh, serving uh, deposit rate is very low in Africa and then the investment coming from other uh, continents now is getting down rather than getting up and also development assistance. You can see from Trump administration they cut those development assistance rather than to uh, uh, pushing forward. So because of this shortage of the financial means and then China now willing to make these uh, things happen in Africa. So we offered a lot of like uh, a China Africa Development Fund and then we have AIIB now even the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank now is willing to do the investment in w Africa. Wait, wait a minute, the last year saw the normalization of uh, the bilateral relationship between Japan and China. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe promised to cooperate with China in building infrastructure in a third country. What did he mean? Uh, yeah. Does it actually refer to mm -hmm. Africa water, for example? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think it's not only Japan. I think we've also seen this with the United Kingdom. They also have a similar program to work with China. But basically what is happening, if you observe China-Africa relationship, is that this has not been done before, at least not on this scale. Um, in terms of financing, if we expect only China to finance the infrastructure gap in, in Africa, enough, of then course. of course uh, that is, is doomed for failure. So the question has become how can uh, even the Americans work together with, with China? And the, you know, from the African perspective, the best thing to do is just to try from single projects because you will learn what works from that project, what doesn't work, and move on to the rest. Everything else is just theory and just discussion. That is, that's, that's how I view the best approach to this. On January the 1st, 1979, the bilateral relationship between the United States of America and China were established during the Carter administration. Now, this senior politician, whom I so respect, I respect so much, said recently about the bilateral relationship between Washington and China, uh, confrontation will have no future. And he said Africa might be a good place for reducing the trust deficit and to promote mutual understanding. Africa needs competition, as you said, wisely. What do you think of the possibility uh, that the two sides, Washington and Beijing, will join hand instead of uh, taking each other as the enemy? Because the Africans uh, won't necessarily uh, uh, buy this idea that uh, what China does here uh, also shares the vision of President Trump about the zero-sum game. This will 100% depend on the Africans. It's as simple mm -hmm. as that. If the host nation is willing to accept both parties and is willing to work with both of them and is willing to set the ground rules, then of course it will work. And we have seen this in Kenya, for instance. There has been high-level state visits from the UK, from France, from, uh, from Korea, from Turkey. So the question is, what are the Africans going to do about it? Because now Africa has become the girl that everybody else wants. So it's as simple as that. I don't think that the big powers should dictate how it's going to necessarily work in the local, local, in the local countries. So I think this ways to be seen. Again, Africa is made up of 54 countries. Each has a different system. Each has a different leader. So it's actually a very good uh, place to test the different kind of uh, cooperation models. Wimping Zimbabwe, for example, has been a very close friend of China. But its image remains very controversial uh, due to the uh, lackluster economic performance and, of course, uh, a confiscation of the farming land by former president of this country, Dr. Mugabe. Having said this, um, what do you think of uh, the image of China uh, to be friend with all countries, including, of course, uh, democracies that started to take root? Uh, in democratic institutions with the end of the Cold War. Uh, China 
President Xi Jinping said, wouldn't why, why for sphere of influence? So we wouldn't fight any proxy wars. But, uh, for example, the issue of corruption always captures headlines these days whenever you look at the Western media regarding the influence of China. What do you think of uh, this kind of a soft peddling approach by China, quote unquote? Yeah, uh, first of all, we need to uh, have our own uh, speaking power. Even though we have been uh, doing quite good job, but this image like uh, hanging around with those corruptive officials or like uh, China's engagement, uh, even uh, driving those uh, corruption behavior becoming, you know, uh, bigger uh, or rather than getting the less, but actually picture is different. Uh, I will highly recommend, uh, you know, the American scholar uh, Broticum, uh, her, her, you know, book is called uh, uh, Dragons, you know, Ch uh, you know, Dragon's Gift in Africa, the real story of China in Africa. So in one chapter he mentioned that China's, uh, you know, assistance to Africa, all those projects, is called the project-driven approach. So which means we are not like a pass through all those money in those recipient countries, their budget. Does China ever seek to have a regime change to lay the groundwork for of building course infrastructure? Not. China's policy is <laughs> non-interference with other countries' domestic issue. So I'm just mentioning about this money issue. Even those monies go all the way to the projects. We are not go via the financial minister, you know, their budget. So actually it's difficult for the local officials doing those corruptive issue because it's not go through their financial, their budget. So it's go all the way to those projects itself. So eventually Let's look at the mega project of uh, help build the headquarters in uh, Addis Ababa of the African mm -hmm. Union. Now, a lot of the Western media would say, hey, let's look at China's uh, ambition and the implications uh, in helping build the headquarters in Addis Ababa. It smacks of uh, a strategic conspiracy or whatever. I mean, it doesn't sound very nice. I think the first question is to ask is who wanted the headquarters? Was it China that wanted headquarters or was it the African Union that wanted the headquarters? This was a gift from China to Africa. In fact, the company that built that headquarters, China State Construction, lost money doing that project. So it's a gift, okay? So you can choose how you want to analyze it. There have been other gifts to other African countries. So I would not read too much into, into, that, into that kind of project. Ethiopia, uh, similarly with other African economies, Wenping is exploring the best possible ways of employing its natural resources and its uh, demographic dividends so as to transform its agriculture-dominated economy towards becoming the manufacturing hub of Africa. Question is, how can China share its development model with them? Or do you, do you think China's model cannot be easily copied by our brothers and sisters in Africa? Yeah, actually a lot of experience now has been taken from China's uh, those, uh, model or experience. Uh, one of the things is this uh, industrial zone. I visited uh, this uh, industrial zone, it's called Oriental Industrial Zone in Ethiopia. So, uh, uh, it has been approved very successful because uh, a lot of Chinese investors uh, set up in that zone and they either produce like shoes or like uh, making cement or <coughs> whatever. So it's becoming a driving force to lead the way of Ethiopia industrialization. So not only those uh, Chinese may build those zones uh, from government or from the private company, now Ethiopia government has built on a lot of industry zones by themselves. Yeah, even some industry zones is leading this environment friendly, yeah, this kind of new uh, thinking. So it has been proved very successful. So even from this one point, I can see uh, this is a good way of uh, learning this China's experience because China's way has been proved. This industry zone like uh, around those, our coastal cities like in Xiamen, like in this, uh, uh, you know, Zhejiang, Jiangsu, so Shanghai, so they have been leading the way and then gradually spill over those experience to those landlocked uh, like China, other provinces. So Ethiopia also, it has led the way and then not only spill over those development uh, results to other parts like agricultural industry and uh, like uh, other like manufacturer and also even goes to other countries like uh, Djibouti. I traveled to Djibouti this uh, uh, last uh, August. So Djibouti people even told me, saying they travel to Addis Ababa very often, but uh, whenever they go, they go there, they see the difference, they see the changes, they see the uh, development. So they also think but they cannot be left behind. <coughs> they have to hurry up. We to have also China. initially established uh, our 
uh, military presence in Djibouti to guarantee yes. our efforts to fight piracy and to escort uh, uh, ships, Chinese and foreign alike. Now, last year saw the 40th anniversary of China's opening up and reform. Our friends, politicians, policymakers in Africa must have followed the process of China's development very closely. Do you think we have anything to learn from China all the other way around to avoid making the same mistakes that we made uh, uh, over the past 40 years? Again, I think for this, one of the uh, references I would use was the speech by uh, His Excellency Paul Kagame at the POCAC last year. He said at the beginning of his speech, very brief speech, first, yes, China, we understand China treats us as equal on the high level. I think everybody has already accepted that. But now when it comes to development, it is the responsibility of every African nation to set its policy and set it, its development path vis-a-vis um, -vis China. So for instance, the example you used of Ethiopia, Ethiopia is a very good example of a country that can successfully replicate the Chinese model. And there are many reasons for that. The Ethiopian system is similar, the system of governance, you know, the, 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 the industrial policy, and it's, it's working successfully. But in other countries, they have a different system, they have a different history, so everybody needs to set their own development path. And I think this has been very clear from the Chinese side. I think what gets emphasized, does not get emphasized as much is, you know, yes, there are things we should learn from China on how to do, but there are also things that we can learn from China how not to do. And, you know, especially the issue of environment, during China's growth, this was seen as something that can be put on the back burner while development takes place. <coughs> Fortunately or unfortunately, the reality is for different countries, this is, you cannot be able to take, sustainably take the same path. But at the same time, there are new technologies that are available today that are not available when China just be, began to open up. So the, long, the, the short answer to your question is it really depends on which African country and the African countries that have specifically set policy with, for engagement with China, for instance, Ethiopia and South Africa, these are the ones that are set to really benefit the most from the relationships. For the others, you know, they really need to, you know. Thank you so much. You don't know how much I appreciate your participation and analysis, which I believe yeah. has somehow provided a, a convincing textbook about the presence of China there and, of course, competition. And we hope the competition should be benevolent between major players, be they United States, European, Chinese, uh, Japanese, or Indians. With that, we come to the end of this edition about the implications of Foreign Minister Wang Yi's visit of Africa. The first of its kind since the start of 2019, which witnessed the 40th anniversary of the bilateral relationship between Washington and China. That's the next time. Good luck.